In this video, I'm going to show you how you can take these super cheap mains powered LED light fixtures and make them dimmable and controllable with an elegant little add-on hack. These LED lighting fixtures are just ridiculously cheap. I think I paid $12 for this. It puts out a really nice white light. It's super thin and low profile, has this neat little mounting system. You can just clip it into a hole in the ceiling. Perfect. Except they're not dimmable. It says so right on the package. So I thought at this price point, it would be worth trying to figure out how I could hack the, the driver and turn it into some kind of dimmable and controllable fixture. So that's exactly what I did. I chose the Dolly protocol. Dolly stands for Digital Addressable Lighting Interface. It's an industry standard used in like high-end architecture. Here's an example of a Dolly dimmer that I bought that basically has a simple push on and off and a knob, as simple as you can get. It sends out digital commands over these two wires to all the lighting fixtures and controls them beautifully. It's a really simple and elegant system. You can also interface Dolly to anything else you want. They have gateways, you can connect it to the internet, do anything you want, so it's totally flexible. The way this works is that we have a small little parasitic add-on circuit that goes in and controls the LED light and makes it dimmable. This little circuit board has a separate power supply and runs on five volts. The Dolly interface circuitry has optical isolators which form the safety isolation barrier between the dangerous mains voltage in the light fixture and the outside world. The microcontroller and MOSFET that do the actual PWM dimming need to be powered by an isolated power supply so they can float on an arbitrary voltage inside the LED light to do their job. Now it's time for the obligatory safety rant. This project involves messing around with AC mains powered electronic devices, which is extremely dangerous. This is actually a project only for those with advanced knowledge of electronics and electronic safety practices. If you don't know what you're doing, don't try this at home. Always use an isolation transformer when you connect your gear and be safe because you can't like my videos, subscribe to my channel or comment if you're dead. Step one for any good hack is really understanding what you're dealing with. So let's take one of these LED lights apart and try to really understand what's going on in there. I have to say this Philips LED batten is an astonishing display of fiendish optimization. It's boiled down to the lowest possible cost and it, I have to say it's extremely elegant in its design. Hats off to the designers here. The housing itself is some kind of super thin dual extrusion. It's made out of two different plastics. The lower part is an opaque white plastic while the upper domed part is actually translucent and forms a perfect diffuser for the LEDs inside. The ends of this extrusion are capped off with simple injection molded parts that snap in forming a neat package. The actual light producing part of this is actually a super thin aluminum circuit board with 86 white LEDs installed on it. They're connected as two series strings of 43 LEDs and those two strings are then connected in parallel. It takes around 140 volts to get this thing to start lighting up. The driver is another super amazing example of modern technology. It's tiny and it has a very low parts count. When I first opened this thing up, I was astonished to see how little was actually on this board. And it performs a pretty amazing function as well. It takes this raw 230 volt AC and converts it to a smooth constant current of about 125 milliamps. That current splits between the two strings of LEDs given about 62 and a half milliamps of LED current. Step two of the process is to reverse engineer the circuit board and draw a schematic so that we can start to understand what's going on. If you're really lucky, you can use your microscope and read the numbers on the chips 
And using Google, you can find the data sheets and figure out exactly what they are. They're not the easiest things in the world to find, but if you do a bit of sleuthing, it can be done. In this case, we find that it's a Kiwi Instruments KP1050, which is a non-isolated quasi-resonant buck LED power switch. Now this little three terminal miracle does a lot of stuff. Let's break the circuit down to its simplest conceptual elements and analyze how it works. Here I've stripped the circuit down to its five core elements for easier analysis. We've got a voltage source, a switch, a diode, a stack of series connected LEDs, and an inductor. With the switch open, not much is going to happen as there is no path for current to flow. When we close the switch, we now have a current path through the series connected LEDs and the inductor. As long as the voltage is higher than the forward drop of all the LEDs combined, the current will start to rise in a linear ramp. It's a linear ramp because the LED forward voltage basically subtracts from the power supply. This applies a, a relatively fixed voltage to the inductor. As the current rises through the inductor, it begins storing energy in the form of a magnetic field. It's this energy storage that forms the core concept of how a switch mode converter works. When the current reaches our target value of 250 milliamps, the IC opens the switch which causes the voltage across the inductor to immediately start to rise, trying to satisfy its craving for continuity. The rising voltage at the switch node causes the diode to become forward biased and forms a new current path where the current decays looping through the LEDs, the diode, and the inductor. It's during this period of time where the energy that was stored in the magnetic field of the inductor is now returned back to the circuit. The rate of current decay is also a linear ramp because it's basically decaying across the fixed voltage drop of the diode and the LEDs in series. When the current reaches zero, the IC detects this and closes the switch again and the cycle repeats. The average current flowing in the LED is then about 125 milliamps, just what we want. The real magic of this process is that there's very little power lost. The difference in voltage between the incoming mains and the LEDs is simply made up by the inductor. It stores energy and it sloshes back and forth. This is so much more efficient than simply burning the difference in a resistor as we often do. Now looking back at the original circuit, we can see there are some additional complexities. Like there's a capacitor that's connected directly across the LED string. This capacitor serves to smooth out the current pulses to a more even DC level. It has a bleeder resistor connected across it to bleed off the charge when you pull the plug. No electric shocks, please. Looking back at the input section, we have a rectifier bridge which rectifies the AC into pulsating DC, two capacitors and an inductor that form an energy storage and filtering network. It's a low pass filter that prevents noise from radiating back out onto the AC line. The IC has just two extra components connected to it. A pair of sense resistors which sets the switching threshold for the peak current and a single capacitor that filters the VDD supply which is about 5.6 volts. And that's really all there is. Now that we have insight into how this works, how do we hack it? Well, what we want to do basically is control the amount of energy that makes it to the LEDs. We need to do this without disturbing the current regulator too much so it's all smooth and happy. What we can do is add an additional switch that provides a shunt path that makes the current flow around the LEDs and not through them. We can then pulse width modulate the switch to control the brightness of the LEDs very effectively. But wait, you ask, why don't we just cut the power to the whole thing? Wouldn't that be simpler? Well, the problem is that if we do that, the current regulator is going to go to sleep. Its power supply is going to be removed and it will then have to reset. And that's not a process that happens instantaneously. We need to keep this current regulator running normally so that there are no glitches or flickering involved in the switching process. If we effectively short out the LEDs, the current recirculation path becomes basically the switch and the diode. 
the inductor now sees a very low voltage when it's recirculating, and this causes the decay time to become very, very long. This lowers the entire effective operating frequency of the whole thing. The incoming power drops dramatically as it only conducts for a very small portion of each cycle. It basically makes it dormant. Looking back at our original circuit here, we can see that just shorting the LEDs is not an option for us. If we did that, it would also short the capacitor across the LEDs, and that would result in a destructive current spike that would kill our switch. So what we need to do is add an additional diode that isolates the LEDs and the capacitor from the current regulating circuit. This way we can basically short out the current regulator and the LEDs just coast along on that capacitor. This new diode allows us to smoothly commutate the current between the LED stack and its capacitor and our shunting switch. PWM is now possible. This scheme of shorting the LED with a MOSFET using PWM works great, except for one little nasty problem. If we happen to fire the PWM pulse at exactly the same time that the inductor current is reaching zero, the current regulator cannot detect that the current went to zero and it does not restart the cycle. This causes a nasty glitch that manifests as flickering LEDs, which is the absolute worst possible thing that can happen. The fix for this problem involves synchronizing the application of the PWM pulse with the current regulator cycle. We want to ensure that the gate pulse is never activated when the current is zero. So if we use the voltage waveform across the inductor to clock a synchronizer, we can make sure that the PWM pulse is only applied when the inductor current is at its maximum. This prevents that glitch from happening entirely. One little side problem with this is that at really low levels of duty cycle, it makes the dimming rather granular. So the workaround for this is to make this synchronization optional. So we turn the synchronization off when we have a duty cycle that is below 50% and turn it on when the duty cycle is above 50%. When the duty cycle is below 50%, the current regulator is shunted away from the LEDs for long enough that even if it glitches, it'll just reset on its own. It times out. So that glitch is basically invisible. This solution requires a flip-flop and an AND gate. I'm completely loathe to add two more IC packages to my design just to fix this little problem. There's got to be a better way. After scouring the microcontroller datasheet for a while, I discover that the comparator module has a flip-flop for pulse synchronization, exactly what I want. I feed the PWM signal back into the comparator module and use the timer one clock input to synchronize it. There's a bit in a register that allows you to turn the synchronizer on or off, so now I can control it in software. Problem solved. Here's the actual LED hack prototype. It's just a piece of perf board that I've added these modules to. This is the actual dolly interface, the two optical isolators, a connector for the dolly input. This guy here is the actual LED driver or ballast from the Philips Batten. This is a 5-volt USB phone charger that I'm using as an isolated 5-volt power supply. And this guy here is the MOSFET and gate driver that controls the ballast. This is the microcontroller and a little program debug connector here. There's really only three wires that connect between these two things that comprise the hack. We have the ground, which is the blue, the orange wire is the drain, and the white wire is the sink. Both the driver ballast and the 5 volt power supply get their mains voltage from these two terminals here. That's where the power goes in. And you can see I've added the extra diode that basically just goes right there. I cut a trace and solder that diode in there and that takes care of that modification. Here's the schematic for the whole hack. The only part that's missing is the five volt power supply which needs to supply about four milliamps. At the left, we have the Dolly interface circuitry. This is a full-featured Dolly interface that allows for bi-directional communication. 
The code I've written so far does not use the transmitter part, but it's there and ready for when I do. Note that the dolly circuit has its own ground, the D ground. This should not be connected to anything else. It needs to be completely isolated by the two optical isolators for safety. Next we have the microcontroller, which runs on 3.3 volts. Notice that the PWM signal that comes out of RC0 loops back to RC2. This feeds it back in so we can use the flip-flop in the comparator module as the synchronizer. The MOSFET gate driver has both an in and an enable pin. This allows us to use it as an AND gate to complete the synchronizer functionality. The sync interface circuit takes the high voltage signals from the LED driver and translates them to a 3.3 volt logic level. It also inverts the signal, which is exactly what we need. Looking at the bigger picture, we can see the three signals that connect to the LED driver. We have the drain, sync, and ground MCU. Now the ground is common to the whole circuit, as well as the 5 volt input. This means that the 5 volt power supply that we use has to be isolated so this whole circuit can float and connect to the LED driver without causing any problems. So now that I've figured this all out, I'm going to bake it down to a little surface mount board and produce maybe a hundred of them. Because I know there's a ton of other light fixtures out there that share this common topology. So I know I can hack them and make them work. For example, this guy comes with this little box. This is the driver. So why can't I just make a bigger box and put the driver and my hack in there and have a complete solution? So it's a really easy way to make awesome controllable light fixtures for not a lot of money. So I'm going to put links to the files for the build materials, the schematics, and the code so you can try this out yourself. And if you find a light that's really cool and really beautiful and it works good with this hack, let us know about it. Tell us about it in the comments below. We can build a little community of light hackers. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please like and subscribe to my channel. Help me grow. Thanks again.